Yeah, thank you so much for, uh, for having this paper on the program and uh, for having me here. Um, so <coughs> I go by uh, Nate, just to make it uh, easier and, and, and shorter. Uh, I just moved to the University of Toronto in August, so I'm uh, what they would call fresh off the boat. Um, and I'm uh, looking forward to uh, learning more about the challenges of, of uh, Canada in terms of household savings and household uh, finan finances. So, um, I'm sure we'll have plenty to talk about it. This is uh, joint work with uh, Yuri Petiniki, who is at uh, MEA in Munich, the Institute of Economics and Aging. And the title is Job Loss Expectations, Durable Consumption and Household Finances, Evidence from Linked Survey Data. So this is um, quite a bit of work in, in, in progress, and there's probably multiple projects that can be done out of here, so I'm very much looking forward to any suggestions and, and input that you might have. So the questions that we started out of are um, quite straightforward. The first one is, uh, how predictive are job loss expectations of workers? So if you survey a sample of employed people, and ask them the question, in 12 months from now, what, what do you think is the, is the probability that you will get unemployed? How predictive is the answer that they give for actual outcomes? So that's the first research question. And then the second question is more along the lines of, say that workers are able to articulate uh, uh, job loss expectations, do they actually matter for any type of behavior? Uh, and of course the first and the second are linked because, yeah, maybe job loss expectations are garbage, then we can stop there, but maybe even if people have articulate job loss expectations, is there any type of behavior that we can see this? We try to push on both frontiers. Now, I'm going to make it uh, very simple. We have to work with what we have. So we work with uh, survey data and the question has been framed for us. Uh, of course in a different way than we would have liked to, but I'm just going to give you what we have and then we can talk about uh, all the pros and cons, and I'm going to wave my hands, and it's all going to be fine. So, here's the wording of the, of the question on job loss expectations. Do you think that there's any chance that you might lose your job in the coming 12 months? That is the question. And then, uh, the, the statement uh, is also given that you can indicate this in terms of a percentage. Zero, zero percent means that you are sure that you will not lose your job, uh, and 100 percent means that you are not sure you will lose your job. So, this is what we have to work with. Uh, so in terms of motivation, there's a couple of literatures that we talk to. And so the first <coughs> one is more of a uh, macroeconomic literature. And so I was very glad that Glenn brought up the systemic risk uh, part. So even though this is an applied micro paper, it speaks to a macro literature. And so the idea is that if you um, uh, look over the business cycle, and you look at episodes where even if unemployment itself does not increase, but say, for some reason, people fear job loss, and so on average, job loss expectations go up. Well, that could affect, or should affect, durable spending, in the sense that people postpone uh, durable consumption. It should increase uh, precautionary savings, according to our models of precautionary savings. And then basically, you get a self fulfilling uh, prophecy, in the sense that uh, people fear job loss, they postpone durables, they increase savings, so they reduce consumption. There will be a recession next period, and then um, exposed, people turn out to be right. They feared uh, job loss in the next 12 months, unemployment increases in the next 12 months, and voila, it, it was actually a, a self-fulfilling prophecy in that sense. Now this little side of what moves job loss expectations, and that is one of the uh, things that we want to talk to, what explains job loss expectations. And so, uh, Ravn and Sterk have a, a paper in the Journal of Monetary Economics that uh, looks at this in the context of a current recession, and then in a current recession, if people fear an increase in job loss expectations, then the next period might actually exacerbate or create what they call a deep recession. The second motivation is measurement. And so uh, there are a couple of papers on the predictive power of expectations, um, but uh, not so many actually. It was surprising to find uh, not so many papers on what is the predictive content of these job loss expectations? And here one thing that we found is that uh, Mel Stevens has a paper in the Review of Economics and Statistics. Nate Hendren uh, uses the same data. Both use the Health and Retirement Survey. So a sample of all the workers, where they ask uh, the same job loss expectations question we use in our setting. And 
the outcome is measured in the same survey. So the typical situation is you work with survey data, and I'm not going to say anything bad about survey data, but the typical setting in this case where you work with survey data is in one way you measure job of expectations, and then a year later you measure the outcome. This, is, this is a, has a couple of potential challenges in the sense that uh, you need to have people that stay in the survey for two ways to measure and the expectations and the outcome. The outcome is typically measured backward looking, <coughs> and so you have to deal with issues of uh, memory. Or in the case of uh, unemployment, it is a surprise, but imperfect recall is, is, uh, is really a thing, and people tend to forget that they were unemployed in the last 12 months. Um, especially shorter, shorter period of unemployment. Uh, and there might be a stigma. And so if people are unemployed for a short period of time in that window of 12 months, find a new job, then they're much more likely, or be hypothesized, that they say, well, uh, I have a job, I'm fine now, and so this, didn't, this, this bad thing didn't happen. Um, yeah. The problem here is a bit that uh, if the dependent variable is binary, which in this case is did you lose your job or not, um, mismeasurement or imperfect recall, say you did lose your job, so you should have been scored a bump, you say that you didn't lose your job, you are at zero, uh, actually induces downward bias coefficients. So it's one of the few cases um, where measurement error on the left hand side actually matters on the right hand side. Always a fun example in my econometrics classes. So, the literature on, uh, we talked about three different strands of the literature. So, the first one is the predictive power of expectations. So, I mentioned the paper by Mel Stevens and Nate Hendren. They used the Health and Retirement Survey, and they, they find that if you uh, look at unemployment, then this job of expectations question predicts uh, transitions into unemployment relatively well. What it doesn't do in their setting is predict movements from employment to employment. So job-to-job uh, -job transitions. And that is where we, we, we have some new findings. This is related to, to a larger literature on, say, income expectations. So I should mention uh, Dominitz and, and, and Mansky here, and uh, Jeff Dominitz in the journal Econometrics. Then there's a, a much smaller literature on outcomes. And so if you then regress certain outcomes, say uh, consumption, on these total expectations, then Mel Stevens finds in the same paper that mixed evidence on food spending in the health and retirement survey. But again, this is annual uh, spending on food. And so um, there are some issues with that particular measure. It, for Germany, there's some mixed evidence on, on, household, uh, on household saving. And so there we, we, we have a, a more uh, larger contribution in terms of outcome. Then there's a third literature, which focuses on the unemployed. And here I should say that we focus on a sample that is employed at the time of the survey. But you can also look at, say, if you have a large enough sample of, say, the unemployed, and you could look back and you can look forward, and you treat the event of unemployment as an event study, then what happens around the time of unemployment? And so in the PSIT, you can do that to a longitudinal survey. And so they find that uh, consumption spending falls the year prior to unemployment. And it's the idea that people see uh, unemployment, the event of unemployment already coming, and they cut down on consumption the year before the event. It's a similar finding for, uh, for the UK. Uh, Browning and Kosky look at, what, at the durable setting, and so they find that um, uh, unemployed are more likely to postpone smaller durables, so say clothing, those expenditures are shifted uh, shift later on. And then um, the paper that uses uh, administrative data for Norway is uh, Boston, Fagen and Tella. And uh, they use this amazing uh, Norwegian administrative data. They look at all unemployed in the sample, and they look four years prior to the end of unemployment. Then you look four years after, so they have a nice nine-year window of um, unemployed where they can follow the unemployed. And they find that savings decrease, uh, increase excuse me, the, year, the year prior to unemployment. So this consists with the first point where consumption falls, savings increase. And it's the idea that currently working have some idea of pending job loss in the next period and already anticipated um, there. 
They also look at uh, safe assets, and so they, find, they uh, see that uh, unemployed tilt from away from risky assets towards more uh, safe assets or liquid assets. So taken together, it suggests that um, workers have some private knowledge of uh, job loss. And what our contribution is in this case is that we piece a whole bunch of these findings together uh, for one sample and one data set. Uh, I know that the organizers said no, uh, no questions, but it would be a, yeah, it would be a bit pity if it's actually silent and I'm talking for 40, 40 minutes. So if you have questions, please interrupt me. Uh, <laughs> I mean, I can always say let's, let's propone for a discussion, eh? so that's, uh, that's the prerogative of the speaker. So the institutional setting is that we look at the labor market in the Netherlands, and there's nothing special about the Netherlands. I said coming from the Netherlands, so I can say that. Um, <laughs> other than uh, two things, uh, they have very good administrative data. It is underutilized, and we can link survey data to the administrative data. The other thing is that the labor market is, uh, the size of the labor market is quite substantial. It's not, it's a small country land-wise, but the population is large, and so, if you would compare, say, this to um, states or labor market uh, of states in the United States, it is larger than the labor market in Pennsylvania. Uh, it's comparable to the labor market in Illinois. It's smaller than the labor market in Texas, but people have told me that everything is smaller compared to Texas. <laughs> Except uh, Australia. Yeah. <laughs> um, and I should, I should update it to the Canadian setting. So uh, I'm going to play my card. I just arrived. I have no idea what the Canadian labor market uh, looks like. So we have 7 million workers employed over the period 2010-2016, which is the, the frame that we look at. Unemployment in this period fluctuated, so it was 5% and then it increased um, to 7.4%. What is more um, noticeable is there is a uh, secular uh, trend in the labor market towards more flexible type of contracts. So Flexible type of contracts in this uh, time, the number of workers or the fraction of workers with a flexible contract rose from one out of five to one out of four workers in the labor market. And with flexible, it could uh, either mean um, fixed term contract, so one year contract or two year contract. Um, it could mean that uh, you have flexible hours of work. So given your contract, uh, you can be on call or you work 20 hours with, with the potential of more. So there's several margins of flexibility, and some we do we observe and some we, uh, we don't in the, in the data there. The main difference between flexible and, say, permanent or a tenured contract uh, is that uh, permanent contracts have um, higher job security compared to, say, the OECD average. Flexible contracts are at the other side of the spectrum, so they have a lower than OECD average um, um, employment protection. So that is a secular trend that plays around here. A little bit about employment insurance. So in, in principle, it's uh, universal. So uh, regardless of your type of contract, whether it's permanent or flexible, uh, you are covered for unemployment insurance if you qualify. Uh, it's universal, and that's also the source of our data. And so I'll come back to that when I talk about the data. So when are you entitled to unemployment insurance? Uh, it has to be no wrongful or untermination. If you have a flexible contract and after a year your contract expires, that is fine. You could still be covered by unemployment insurance. If 11 months out you quit your job or you shoot your boss, something like that, uh, then you don't, don't apply, for, don't qualify for unemployment benefits. The other thing is that you should be available for work, which is not something we see in the administrative data, but uh, there is a search requirement. So conditional on uh, receiving unemployment benefits, uh, you should be available for work, and you should be searching for a job. So we're going to assume that if you get unemployment benefits, you qualify for those two uh, things. And this is in principle uh, monitored, and in principle there are sanctions. And I'm saying in principle because uh, the minimum qualification for job search is that you send out one job application a week. Uh, and there's nobody checking whether this is like a fake job application or like a real job application. So. You could apply for a CEO position, you get declined, and that would still count as a job search. Uh, the other thing is that it depends on the length of employment prior to the spell. And so this could potentially get some um, 
fixed contract people into uh, into problems if they don't have enough labor history before uh, an employment. Replacement rate is quite generous. It's 70% of the average earnings in the 12 months prior to an employment. And 75% uh, for the first two months, so there's the step function of 75% and 70% in the months after that. The surveys, uh, the data that we use, so we use two household surveys. Uh, both are representative household panels for the Netherlands. Both are administered by the same research data collecting agency, Center Data. But they're independent, so they're independently drawn samples. One is uh, the longer run Dutch uh, Central Bank Household Survey. And the other is more recent, is the, is the LISP panel. The LISP panel is larger, and that turned out to be the sample that we worked with for the most. Longitudinal data, so households are followed over time. When households drop out of the, of the sample, they're replaced with households that look similar on some observable characteristics. The principle we have data from 2008 to 2018, and so households are on average like four years, four or five years in the, the data. Just a clarifying question, because I, I know the center panel pretty well. Um, has anyone ever done work on uh, attrition on unobservables? It's got nothing to do with observables, as Heckman has taught us. It's got everything to do with unobservables. And you've got excellent data to do that. You uh, that's a good one. Not that I'm aware of. But we, we, in principle, we could, because we can track people in the admin data. Yeah, that's great. Yeah. Um, the, if you worry about the wording of the job loss question, uh, given that they're administered by the same uh, data collecting agency, they actually chose the same wording for the job loss question. Uh, for the current employed. So this is what it looks like over time. So uh, from 2008 to 2018, the reason that we used two surveys was also to uh, corroborate the findings of both surveys, just to see if they claim to be representative for the population, uh, to representative samples of the population, and see if that actually fans out. And that seems to be uh, the case. So the test line is the Dutch household survey, the solid line is the list panel, and this is 2008 to 2018. 2008 is right after the financial uh, crisis the, in, in the Netherlands, but then in 2013 we had a double dip, and so there was an, a, another uh, recession, and you just plainly see that this, uh, on average, in the cross-section, predicts really well. So jobless expectations, on average, for the currently employed, go up, and then they go down all the time. These are the histograms for both surveys, and again, they line up pretty nicely. 0%, um, 50%, 100%. Um, there's nothing spectacular about the Netherlands in this case. So if you look at the, the pictures for the health and retirement survey, if you look at the similar questions in other countries, all these pictures look remarkably similar in the following three ways. So there's a, a relatively large spike at 0%. So the people that say with absolutely 0%, I'm not going to lose my job, uh, that is about 40% in, in, in the data. There's a small uptick at 100%. So there's a couple of people who say in the next 12 months, with surety, I'm going to lose my, my job. Uh, and then there is an uptick at 50%. So this is all, uh, also well documented that people say, uh, are you going to lose your job? Uh, it's 50-50, what do I know? And so it might be more a measure of uncertainty or uh, ignorance than a 50% probability. We're going to take the data as given, so we're just going to work with the data and then we're going to slice up them in, in, in probability uh, baskets. Do we have any match between this and what's actually happened to those people? No. Yeah. We'll uh, yeah. show you uh, what we do. So we have administrative data from Statistics Netherlands. And so we have monthly payroll data for the universe of firms or for the universe of workers. Both public and private, this is to tease the Germans, because they have the private sector, but not the public. We have the public uh, workers um, as, as, as well. And so maybe what we do is the month that you're being surveyed, we can track you 12 months out, and we can uh, see what happened to you. Uh, that's what we do in the administrative data. We also have uh, monthly car acquisitions. So we have the universe of car registrations, which is also available at Statistic Netherlands. And we can say, from the month of the survey, 12 months out, uh, what do you actually do in terms of car acquisitions? And then we have annual household assets. Um, this is provided by both banks and the tax authority to Statistic Netherlands. They compile it in some um, broader asset and liability categories. 
as at the end of the year. And so that's what we use there. Then we link the two. So we link both surveys to the administrative data. We work in a closed environment at Statistic Netherlands um, for obvious reasons. Um, the households are being asked consent. So the data collecting agency asks them, are you fine with being linked to Statistics Netherlands data? This is the Netherlands, so 85% say, sure, I'm fine with that. Uh, and they give consent. If you're worried about uh, this is scary data, uh, which it is, then um, everything is anonymous. So we can track individuals, we can track households, we can track cars, but everything is uh, meaningless numbers. So statistics analysis makes sure that there's no disclosure of uh, private individuals or private households. But you, yeah. can, but you can identify them. There's a large literature on they needed three pieces of information to figure out who Banksy was. Yeah. So. so what statistics analysis does there, I mean, I can identify them. I'm not supposed to. Uh, I have to sign for that. Uh, what statistics analysis does is that whatever output I present, they have to screen it first. Yeah. I understand. Yeah. Um, <coughs> and there is some literature that this is recorded. That is, that might, not my, my topic for proof, but we call that. Um, so output is checked for disclosure. Uh, there. So everything I'm, I'm going to show you has been checked for. Uh, so this is, um, this is what happens. So the month that people are being surveyed, are you losing your job? We track them 12 months out. And we start to count in the first month. Are you still working at your current firm, or did you lose your job? But there's a couple of other possibilities that can happen. So we uh, flag households as uh, losing any, any, any type of job loss in the 12 months, based on this counter. But then we, class, we have four different categories, because you can uh, lose your job or switch jobs, stay in the same firm. And the reason that we know that is because we have a contract identifier. We have identifiers for everything above them as a contract identifier. And so it could possibly uh, very well be that you change your contract but you stay within the same firm. That is not a whole lot, but it's 70% of all switches that, or all, all, all transitions that we see. What is much more common, which is a third of all uh, people that switch jobs, is that you uh, have an employment to employment without a spell or without an interruption. That would be a new job, new firm. So you, so if you get a new job at a new firm without any <coughs> employment, that is 30% of all uh, job transitions. Then it can be that you move into unemployment. That doesn't mean that within these 12 months you're not going to find a new job, but that means that the first transition that you see is into unemployment, collecting unemployment benefits. That is 70% of all switches. And then we have a category that we cannot uh, classify in any of the other three. Yeah. So can you distinguish between who is fired and who quit? So admin data is uh, wonderful, but not in that regard. So we cannot uh, distinguish between uh, fire and, and quit. So say voluntary, dis uh, vol yeah, voluntary quits or involuntary quits. Because it could be endogenous. If I know I'm going to quit in a year's time. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I'm, I'm going I'm to come back to that. Because uh, people predict a really, really well new job in firm and into unemployment. Uh, and so there might be a labor market component to that. And that is the part where we have something uh, it was a new finding that we contributed to, uh, to, this, to the literature. Uh, job loss is defined as a uh, loss of contract, uh, which may not really work with new job, new firm, because it might very well be that I stay in my own position and just get a new contract. That may not be a job loss as, uh, as there. And so we have some, in, perhaps in the future, we're just going to drop this category out of it. We just wanted to see what happened. Unemployment is defined as collecting unemployment benefits, which is not perfect, but uh, unemployment benefits you can see in the admin data. But there's a group of people that are unemployed, available for work, searching for work, not collecting unemployment benefits, and they would, they would show up in the other job loss category. But other job loss might also be people that are on the fringes of the labor market. So they just uh, they do a job for some time, then they leave the labor market, uh, labor force, uh, and they would show up in the other job loss category. Uh, we don't consider for the moment transitions into uh, self-employment or retirement. So if in this period you move into retirement, we just take you out of the sample. If you move into self-employment, take you out of the sample. Maybe in the future we can do this. Sorry, just back on various points. So when you quit and when you retire, don't you get different unemployment benefits? Could it change? 
Well, so so if you quit, you're not entitled, uh, entitled to unemployment benefits. So, but if you quit, you could move to a different firm. Okay. And so it would show up as an as an E to E uh, transition. Yeah. Okay. So far, so good. So let's go into the results. How predictive are job loss expectations of uh, workers? So this is unconditional. This is just plotting the raw statistics for the, the raw sample statistics for the uh, sample. So on the horizontal axis, these are the job loss expectations in bins, so 10% uh, bins. And here is the uh, uh, probability of any job loss. So these is the four categories lumped together. There's a mild in in increasing line, and then it gets really steep here uh, at the 90, 100% range. It's definitely not at the 45 degree line that has been well documented. So uh, now Stephen is the same thing. So basically, up to this point, it's under the 45 degree line, and then it goes up. When we look at the um, different categories, basically for new job, new firm, <coughs> the unconditional state is pretty flat. That will change when we go to the conditional uh, probabilities. For the unemployment, <coughs> This seems, to, this, this seems to be driven by the people that move into unemployment. And this is a year before, this is basically asking in the next year, do you expect to lose your job? And so there seems to be that these people have a very good idea that in the next 12 months they are going to be unemployed, which might be selection. And then for the other job loss category, it's basically uh, flat. Now, now that these, these are not scaled by the uh, unconditional probabilities of moving into this state. So they're, uh, Okay, so these are in the, in, in the regressions. This is marginal effect after profit. We control for uh, a whole bunch of observable characteristics that we can take into account. And then uh, this is, do you lose your job any of the four categories uh, in there? So this was the baseline of 22% any job transition. And so this is uh, a one percentage point increase in job loss expectations translates into a 0.8 or plus to 0.9 percentage point probability of uh, losing any job. New job, same firm, basically nothing here. And so that gives us the idea that these people are probably different, or these type of transitions are probably different, not well explained by these um, job loss expectations. New job to new firm is about um, every increase of 1% uh, in job loss expectations, it translates into a 0.5 percentage point increase in an E to E transition, so without any interruption. Into unemployment, it's larger than one. So a one percentage point, in, a one percentage point increase in job loss expectations translates into one with four percent probability of getting in, in, into, into unemployment and then in any job loss. This is what the uh, plot of coefficients uh, uh, look like. So these are plot of the regression coefficients in the in, in, in bins with the uh, confidence intervals. Conditional on all observable characteristics that we, we have in the data. So new job, same firm, pretty much zero. New job, new firm, there's an increase uh, in, in, in the trend there. New job, uh, uh, job into unemployment, uh, this is pretty much continuously increasing, and then this is the other job loss. Yeah. So what we bring into the literature is that what now Stevens found for all the workers in the HRS was this pattern for the move into unemployment. What he didn't uh, have was this for uh, this pattern from the uh, employment to employment transitions. One particular reason, and that's something we should look in and we don't look in, is that uh, for all the workers, maybe the labor market looks different. And so for all the workers, this is a very hard transition to make. This is a relatively easier transition to make. So conditional on losing your job, uh, finding another job is, might be harder or there might be a spell of unemployment into finding another job. So, that was the first part. For the, um, we conclude that job loss expectations are quite predictive of both E2E and E2U transitions. So both new job, new firm, and movement into unemployment. And what about the outcomes? Do we see any behavior after that? This is um, car acquisitions. So this is job loss expectations and on the probability that you buy any car. And I'm gonna uh, qualify any car on the next slide and we split them into used cars and new cars. So this is uh, the probability to acquire any type of car. 
that is pretty, there's nothing to see here. This is pretty much zero. We have a measure of the value of the car, um, because all cars in the Netherlands are imported, and so we have for some of the cars the import value of the car. We put a depreciation, a depreciation schedule uh, to that to get a current estimate of the car. If you don't like that, that is fine. Um, what we find is a negative relationship between uh, higher job loss expectations conditional on buying the car, the, 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 the value of the car is smaller. When you say conditional, you did a hurdle model? This, this, this is the, uh, this is the width. Oh, you should do a hurdle, turbus model, but anyway, that's... No, it doesn't... Turbus, look, no. Like the hurdle is very different than turbus. Yeah. Hmm. yeah, we can do it. Yeah. Um, then if you look at the uh, probabilities of job loss in brackets, so it, it, to see if there's if this this average effect, how does this look over the over the distribution? So then we find that if if there's any conditional, if there's any 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 response, they seem to be driven by the the middle range of so the people who are slightly more uncertain about the probability of of, of job loss uh, than the average. It's not really driven by people who are absolutely sure or uh, on, on both sides of the. Of this so there seems to be a role for uncertainty in here. When we split the type of cars, because we know um, whether this is a used car or a car that is new to the country, we don't assume that, we find that um, conditional on buying a car, uh, the action is action on the new cars. So people shy away from buying new cars but not so much from buying used cars or second-hand cars, but we see a previous owner in the, in the data. So basically, a an, 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 an one percentage point increase in job loss expectations decreases the probability to acquire a new car with 0.28 percentage probability. And again, this seems to be driven by the, 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 uh, the middle ranges of the, of the distribution. Now, the two pieces of information are not necessarily uh, ecosystem with each other. The, uh, the value of a car, a new car, would want to be higher value cars. And so if you're more or less likely to buy a new car, then that shows up in the value of the car. So higher job loss expectations are negatively correlated with car value of the acquired car, and higher uh, job loss expectations are negatively correlated with the probability of acquiring new cars. By the way, to get a feel for the dimensions, the overall probability to buy a car is 10% in the data. 9% of that is, or 90% of that would be used cars, 10% would be new cars in the data. So that's a non-trivial uh, amount for the new cars. Okay, when we look at uh, expectation errors, and it, we have to be a bit difficult there because we have four potential outcomes. And uh, at least two of those outcomes in, term, in terms of uh, employment to employment or employment to unemployment uh, transitions uh, could be endogenous. In the sense of, if I expect uh, to lose my job, uh, then I'm going to search very hard and then low, uh, lower my uh, reservation wages. Uh, I might also just uh, um, translate this into postponing of buying a new car or increasing my savings. So there's an endogeneity issue here. We sidestep that for, uh, for a second that we just look at any transition or any uh, job loss situation, uh, how does that line up? And so we find a pattern here for the expectation errors that uh, people who make expectation errors are less likely to buy a car and more likely to buy lower valued cars. And there's an asymmetry in whether you make uh, negative errors or whether you make positive errors. Do you know these people live in households? They might have a partner that's got a job. Uh, yeah, so we could draw for household income. Uh, we haven't looked at uh, partner uh, Employment. A part of employment. I mean, we, we, we could. We, we, we could. Yeah. Okay, let me skip to um, the savings. And so this is the change in uh, financial wealth. Just before we get to savings, I'm still not trying to understand why there's the hump in the middle of 41 to 60 percent nice. What is your story as to why they are the ones that this is like it? So uh, if you think about the certainty, then the people in the, in, in the middle, it's a binomial distribution. But it, 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 the people in the middle uh, have, to have the highest uncertainty about uh, whether they will go to So if you think about the precautionary measures or measures driven by uncertainty, it, it should be the people in the middle. But if I'm certain I'm going to lose my job next year. Yeah, then you adjust your plans with certainty to, with, with certainty to, to that. And so in terms of expectation errors, there's not a whole lot 
uh, uh, that you would bear. There's a lot of evidence in these sorts of surveys that you get a massive spike at 50. If someone says, oh, I really think I might, it's anywhere between 25 and 75, they all collapse to 50. This is very well known. Yeah, but there's, we still have a lot of mass uh, around 50. Yeah, I know. I'll, I'll say, say 40, I'll say 60, but there's, there's quite, massive quite evidence of people will focalize on 50. But your point about uncertainty is exactly right, but I mean, anyway, that's what I'm saying. So you got a lot of people at 50, they're the ones who are uncertain. We should, we, should, we, should, we should see what, what happens if we take out the 50 answers. Uh, to the, to the, to the entire term by the 50 50 answers. Or <coughs> we, we can do uh, Okay, in my remaining five minutes, let me focus on the savings, uh, savings behavior. So these are nominal values. So this is the change in uh, assets at the end of the year minus the change at the, at the beginning of the year. And so what we find is that people with uh, higher job loss expectations save less. So this is uh, savings as in deposits. We have the change in stock value for, the, uh, for, for everybody and then the sum of the two is financial wealth. And so what we find is that the 10% increase in total expectations translates into an 80 euro uh, increase in savings on a uh, mean of 400 euros. So uh, a, relative, a relative amount, this is a, a substantial increase in savings. Now, but if this is enough to offset if we're talking in the model. So that there, is, that there is an increase in savings, that is, uh, that is all right. But whether these people save enough or save too much or take a behavioral perspective, save too little, uh, we definitely need the benchmark to uh, actually do that. So here we just like to document the correlation uh, with that. And we find a little bit of a decrease in, in, in stock value, but it's not statistically significant. And then we find an increase in financial wealth that is. Uh, less than that. But also there, we find most of the action is in the middle. And so it's those people who are like relatively uncertain about what's going to happen. Those are the people that increase their uh, savings and increase their um, financial wealth. And then finally, we look at uh, end of year wealth holdings, just to see if there's any uh, shifting of balances at the end of the year. And so this is, a, this is a thousands of uh, thousands of euros. And so a 10% increase in job loss expectations increases the stock of deposits with four, uh, four, four, 480 euros and financial wealth as well. And also here, it's, this seems to be pretty much driven by um, uh, over the entire distribution. But if you look at people who are very certain at the top, they save more into uh, riskless assets as well as risky assets. So it doesn't seem to be a whole lot in terms of shifting around. They just increase their savings in both um, categories. So to wrap up, higher top loss expectations are positively correlated with savings flows. So it's a change in uh, deposits. Higher job loss expectations are negatively correlated with change in risky assets, though not statistically significant. But then we find that financial portfolios seem to be tilted uh, towards savings at the end of the year. So this is a collaboration of the findings that uh, Boston and all found, for example, of actual unemployed. So what we do is we look at before unemployment at the sample of all workers, and uh, what happens there, so complement that. So to conclude, um, the first research question was how predictive are job loss expectations, and then we find it predicts a really well movement into unemployment. That's good news. But it also predicts a really, really well movement um, from firm to firm. And there there seems to be an, an underlying labor market story in terms of search effort or search intensity or reservation wages that, uh, has not been, that I'm not aware of. And so we could push a little bit uh, towards there. For example, one thing we could do there is we could say, because we know the wages of the firm that you go to, um, do you move to a lower quality firm in terms of wages? Uh, so this is something that we can do, should do uh, there. In terms of car acquisitions, we find that people shy away from uh, new cars and basically downgrade to parts of used cars. And in terms of household finances, we, we find uh, pre evidence for pre pre savings there. Yeah. And thank you very much. So Nate, thanks so much for presenting a really cool paper. It's a great opportunity to to talk about it. And I'm actually pretty excited about, please, I twist my ankles, I'm really on this. Um, I think Nate did a great job of describing what um, he did, and I have kind of a different idea about how you might frame it, which is why I think it's going to be fun to 
to have this conversation. Um, okay, so um, just stepping back for a second, this is a paper about two things that are both really interesting but are different from each other. So one is we have job loss expectations, right? And expectations are super important, well, for reasons I'm going to talk about, um, in a bunch of macro consumption models, and we're going to talk about that at length. And then there's another feature of this, which is that this is a paper about surveys. And surveys are interesting and important, or uninteresting, or un depending on who you ask, that's a research question, um, as a proxy for true things. And this, is, this gives us a chance to speak to that issue. So this is papers bringing together these two really interesting issues, which is what are surveys good for in terms of eliciting true things? And then um, what is the role of expectations in driving behavior, and we're able to put those together in a way that I think is really cool. Okay, so if we just talk a little bit about the, putting aside the survey part of this, but just focusing on the expectations part, um, expectations are central to consumptions and savings and macro models, permanent income hypothesis. There's a huge literature on the consequences of job loss and thinking about the expectations versus realizations. Um, and, you know, these show up in buffer savings models, precautionary models. So, just in a lot of these consumption, labor, leisure, decision making, expectations are really central. And the key empirical challenge and the key you know, theory challenge is that if you see somebody's income change, let's say they lose their job, that's, you know, or they get a raise, or you know, really there's any change in their circumstances, and we wanna understand how that links to some change in their behavior, we wanna ask ourselves, is this a shock? Or is this something they anticipate? Because if it's something they anticipated, the permanent income hypothesis, which may or may not be right, and you know, has some assumptions, but says sh you shouldn't, the change shouldn't matter if it's anticipated. The only thing that should matter is the shock, right? So the reason expectations in that context are critical is if you could get the true expectation, then comparing the realized outcome with the expectation tells you the shock. So expectations have this central role of theoretical interest because they give us the benchmark that we can use to create the thing that we often care about, right? So, and furthermore then, the expectation is likely to be correlated with our view of permanent income. If you expect to become unemployed, you're in a lifetime sense poorer, and you should be acting on that expectation now before it happens, right? So we should be thinking about, about all those issues if we have the true, um, if we knew the true expectation. Okay, so what's cool about this is it relates to us, the second point I wanted to make, which is I'm really delighted that we have Glenn Harris in the room because Glenn is famous for, in my, in, my, you know, in the room with me often, being appropriately skeptical of surveys because he's, you know, it, please tell me if I'm misrepresenting your views. What's that? Because I know better. Yeah, but, but the specific way in which you know better is this is cheap talk. People can say whatever because there's no incentives to be truthful or not. So what's super cool about this project is we have an explicit empirical test of that idea, right? So the rubber is meeting the road, and we're going to be able to see what is the empirical content of this, we, you know, of this true, of this true thing. And the expectations are a particularly important place for this because you could have a survey that asks you what is the color of your car, right? And we can see if that's true or not. But we don't need to survey you to get the color of your car. You can just look up the car records. Whereas expectations are something in your head. And so it's true that there may be some experimental way to elicit them, but your regular behavior doesn't provide a natural elicitation. So it's a natural thing to try to get from a survey or from some experimental design intended to, to elicit. But what they've got here is they're matching the expectations with the outcomes, and then we get to see if people act on it. Okay, so the first question is, when people think they're gonna lose their jobs, do they actually? There is some empirical content in that. I, we could argue about how strong it is, but it's not a 45 degree line, but it's clearly an upward sloping line. So that shows that there is some empirical value in these surveys, but it also shows that people's expectations are clearly imperfect. And the spike at 50%, like there's no real spike at 50%. That's just how people talk. Okay, the next thing that they, the authors do, which I think is really interesting, is that they compare these expectations and the shocks, both of them, um, to an actual decision you actually make, right? Because in a permanent income hypothesis or any of these consumption models, we have some sense that permanent income as measured by your expected job loss or the shock, which is the gap between the realization and the expectation should both matter for consumption decisions. So here we have consumption decisions, for example, in the form of your car value, and you can figure, figure out to what degree there's empirical content there. Um, so we see, in fact, 
that in certain dimensions, there's a correlation, an association between um, both your expectations and your shocks, realization relative to expectations, in these car values. Um, so just a, clear, a suggestion I had for this is, I would encourage you to be a, uh, a little bit more formal about the timing conventions around like, when is the car value being measured relative to when the expectations and the shocks are being measured, and how that maps to a permanent income hypothesis or other consumption savings model. So you have some underlying view that um, first we have some beliefs, right? Then we get a shock, and then you're going to respond to them. Or maybe we have some view that we had an update to our beliefs, and that's the shock we respond to. But we want to have some underlying consumption model that drives this variation. Right? And the reason that that's um, important is because there's an endogeneity problem with job loss expectations. Right? So potentially, job, lock, job loss expectations might be a proxy for um, a bunch of other stuff. So this is a room full of professors, some graduate students too. Right? So those of us with tenure have you know, approximately 0% chance of involuntary layoff. Um, junior faculty on you know, fixed term multi-year contracts the same, even if there may be longer term uncertainty. So we can look at the variation between us and normal people with regular jobs in outcomes, and we might ask the question, do we buy nicer cars or less nice cars than the population at large when we have lower expectations of unemployment? But of course, professors differ from other people in a host of other dimensions, and you want to ask the question, is it our low expectations, as proxy by the survey, that is driving the fact that we drive Priuses and Volvos, or is it the fact that we're nerdy, conservative, geeky, you know, whatever, some other features of professors, right? So when we look at the effect of expectations on outcomes, we don't know it's the causal effect of expectations on outcomes. It could be that expectations are a proxy for something else that we, that we care about, right? So, so when we look at expectations, um, that matters. Then the, the authors also do something which I think is a great idea, which is they look at the, the shocks, the expectation errors on outcomes. And there we want to think about the fact, um, there if it's a proxy that doesn't matter because you're not comparing high and low expectations, you're comparing people with the same expectations with different outcomes. But then you want to think about the fact that the informational content here isn't perfect, right? So if you look at a shock, some of it is the true revelation, some of it is some error about the survey being cheap talk. And so since you've got the gap there, you have to worry that the error is going to be um, problematic. So, um, so I think you know, there's a challenge here of endogeneity. Uh, I think that a way you can handle that is with a much more formal model of timing. So for example, look at guys who have expectations today, look at their job loss over the next year, and then look at their change in car purchase over two year period, in other words, ex post after the fact. So you can figure out whether it's the job loss that's causing the car, or the car that's, you know, or the sub knowledge about both that's causing, well, is it the expectations or the loss that's doing what and in what order. Because what we really care about is shocks or innovations. So th you can totally do that in this data. I just think you want to be a little more careful about that. The other thought I have that I think would be really, really neat is we think that there's, well, you've shown, there's empirical content in the survey, right? But then there's another question, which is, does my behavior today contain additional information I don't disclose in the survey? In other words, I say I have a 0% chance of a job loss, but the fact that I just or you know, 100% chance of a job loss, but the fact that I just went out and bought a fancy new car maybe suggests that that was a wrong expectation. So there's, my actions convey additional information not conveyed in my survey response. So if I see somebody who says they're kind of likely to lose their job, but then they buy a fancy car versus they don't, is that provide additional information about whether they're actually going to get uh, laid off or not, which I think, again, relates to this idea of what's the informational content of surveys. We know there's some, but then do people's actions speak louder than their words or speak in addition to their words, or is everything you can learn about somebody's expectations, uh, true expectations, embedded in their survey response? And that's something we're going to, you can figure out. Uh, okay, so I thought this was a great project. I thought it had great data, and I hope this is helpful in terms of framing what you can do with it, but like clearly this is a really exciting thing to work with, and I was really got thrilled to get the chance to talk about it. Yeah, thanks, uh, thanks, Stephen. 
all your points are well taken. So it's a, um, I must think about it. Yes, so it seems like if you're thinking about this 50%, 40 to 70, whatever we want to think about it as, as having this potential job loss um, and also not really understanding where a lot of people are going, right, in this other category, um, could you link to birth records of these people and see if they have young children or are just just now having children and exiting the labor force entirely? Um, for perfectly rational reasons, and maybe they thought before, hey, I don't know how I'm doing at work, I don't know what's happening with my life, I have a lot of this uncertainty, and then if they're staying at home, that might be a perfectly rational, and actually if you have multiple kids, it might even be a smarter decision than staying at work. Um, but that could be a huge part of that population, especially if they're dropping retirees and their age distribution is such that. Yeah, this is uh, absolutely there's an, there's an embarrassment of riches in the the in the admin data um, and with great data comes great responsibility. So uh, <laughs> the, the the onus is on me to, uh, to 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 work with that. But yeah, we can we can look at, at uh, classical indicators of people that are closer to the margin of the labor market. Because they might also have different um, like car buying decisions too, right? Yeah, and one thing that we found is, uh, by the way, I didn't mention it, but one thing that we found was really, really important in the uh, uh, prediction to buy a car is the length of time since you last bought a car, which you can it makes a lot of sense, <laughs> but it's, 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 a, it's a variable typically not available in, 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 in that, that's a uh, Yes. So related to the points that uh, Stephen uh, raised, uh, so you have this effect uh, on saving, for example, that's the one I'm interested in, that is uh, sort of happening, but apparently a lot of things are happening in the middle when people are uncertain. So, so when it's 100% or 0% uh, risk, uh, this is mostly about intertemporal substitution. Um, you know, changing pacing consumption. When it's in the middle, then there's also precautionary saving that comes in. So I wonder, I, I wasn't clear on the timing, a bit like what Stefan explained, whether it's the saving is at the same time as the job loss is happening, or is it post or before. But there is something to do there, uh, exploiting the heterogeneity in the job loss expectation, that at the end you're thinking more about intertemporal substitution. In the middle, maybe you're thinking more than about risk. And so I wonder whether you've thought of how to, how to exploit that, or how to think about that. Yeah, so the, in, the, in terms of the timing, uh, they basically take you the moment that you enter the survey and then say 12, 12 months out, or whatever the next measurement of income to the savings, which is at the end of the, the, end of the year, and then we take the, the difference in the savings. One. Okay, so it becomes in between. Yeah, so it's not because the survey is asking in April, May, so it's not 100% uh, like waiting eight months until the end of the year. But you have access to the data going back and forth. Yeah, so we may say from January, so the, the, the timing is there a little bit weird. Uh, yeah. And you can't extend to... Yeah, we can, we can, we can look further out okay. the, the, next, the next year, but that will be then uh, 30 months. Uh, um, you've got expectations of people's livelihood and not of job loss, but do you know anything about the expected duration of unemployment? So when you come to look at savings, you will think that people are going to respond to the expected duration. Is there a way, I, I don't know if there's survey asset directly, but is there a way of sort of, one of the things that could be affecting people's probabilities is also a compression of duration to their estimation of probability. Yeah, so if I would do this, uh, this, this survey myself, I would do it better, of course, but uh, <laughs> I, would, I would ask the question, uh, uh, do you expect to leave your job voluntary or involuntary? So that, that's Mansky's idea. You, you have to ask a question to get together. Uh, but you can also think about a hypothetical. Say you were to lose your job, how long do you think you will, you will find to, to, to find a new job? Um, now, in the same survey for the people that are currently unemployed, they ask the question of what do you think is your job finding probability? We haven't used it at all, but there is a small sample there that has a bit of the same. But actually, the, just on that very point, uh, the survey of consumers by the University of Michigan has historically asked over different horizons. If you ask the same person over six months, one year, up to five years, that would be a way to get a sense of what you're getting, and not, not exactly, but that's the standard way to do it. We did that in Denmark, by the way, in 2003, 
Um, we, I didn't know then the importance of incentivizing surveys, I'll admit, um, but we asked about seven questions of people in 2003-04, and they're linked to the registry. So we know their entire family, we know before, that 17 years ago, I'm pointing at Philippe because he's got access to the registry now. And we asked about 10 questions on interest rates, on employment, on a few beliefs over different horizons. That is a great suggestion because they feel that a um, 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 separate module where they ask the same job loss question. And I had been, I had been thinking a different interval, so, so I had been thinking what I could do with that. But I think it, that rolling window reveals exactly the probability of, of updating new information there. So that's a great suggestion. So can you match the data with uh, on five years balance sheet and mm -hmm. that statement? Can you match the data with the employer's income statement or the balance sheet? Of, of, the, of the firm or the firm? Of the firm. Yes. So so maybe an interesting question would be to look at whether people correctly understand who in the firm is protected and who is in share, like how like the, the risk is allocated within, uh, within, uh, within the firm across the trees. Yeah, so, 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 so we, we, we can. Um, most of the firms uh, are not incorporated. From, so most of the workers don't work for incorporated organizations. And we lose a lot of the money sort of selection there. Uh, but we could, in principle, uh, in principle do that. Uh, people in the past have looked at plant closures. The, the, for the number of transitions, uh, there are actually not that many plant closures that cause these transitions. And most of the transitions in the labor market are voluntary. Do you have any information on the mortgages and house ownership? Because it will differ a lot the incentives, especially if you are in a social housing or a free renting. Because sometimes if you're self-employed, you actually have incentives to stop working in order to stay on the cap Ooh, no. for the to be eligible for the social housing. No. So we know whether people are homeowners or not. We know that if you're not a homeowner, then most likely you are a renter. We don't know if they are renters of social housing. We uh, basically kick out, uh, I think we kick out, so the, the question is not asked to people who are self-employed, mm -hmm. those are out, and uh, any transition into self-employment, we also release those people out. But, uh, but the housing will not be part of the financial wealth, what you have there. No, we leave that, we leave that. And actually, you have a very rich period for the housing, given how the prices were going down until 2013, and then... Oh yeah, there's, 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 a lot of, there's, there's a lot of additional macro or systemic risk that is going on in, 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 in the period of time. So it's two, two quick points. There's a beautiful paper by Mansky and Molinari uh, on rounding in probabilistic surveys. It's not a spike at 50, but uh, essentially uh, with probabilistic surveys, you get, don't, people don't report 41%, they report 40 and so he talks about econometric methods for treating that as interval data. And, and it's, I'll, I've sent it to you, it's, it's, you should pay attention to it. The second issue is hypothetical bias. I've sent your papers on the evidence here. Let's assume just for the moment that there is hypothetical bias in these surveys, in which case the issue is not, as many people say, but I get results when I run a regression. Are you getting the right coefficient on the results? That's the, it's called identification. Um, so I suspect one should talk about that a little bit. There has been some work in Denmark uh, by some people at the University of Copenhagen uh, literally asking people survey questions for which they know the true answers in the registry. And you, nobody oh. wants to see the results there. Their measurement error is nasty and massive. And it's a very, very important study. I believe they did some, some expectations questions. I do not know that. So, that, but uh, I, I can give you the, the feeling that they know that the guy Anyway, we know the guys there. Um, having said that, you really want to pay attention to the concern about hypothetical bias because it's actually nuanced. It's not like surveys are always wrong. It's just some questions they don't answer well, and others they answer dismally. For example, here, my con one concern I would have is, um, does this do, do, do I have an incentive because I plan on quitting in order to get a welfare check. And I know Dutch people understand the welfare system extremely well, really well, <laughs> really well. Do, and I go to my boss and say, look, if you fire me, you know, uh, I'm in a blue collar job, but it's a white collar, doesn't bother me, doesn't, doesn't follow me. I'm very concerned about that sort of strategic gaming type of issue. And, you know, there I think one needs to look into exactly why people respond in different ways. And there you've got to use the administrative data. I think it's very exciting. You can also get, sorry, the center panel can do experiments. 
So yeah, and the lift panel as well. So we can, uh, yeah. so both, both panels allow. I mean, incentivize experiments, not, not. Well, well, you can, you can, you can, uh, you can, you can pay them. Yeah. It's yeah. okay. Uh, but do, do we have, do we have now uh, Glenn on camera saying that there is some value in service? <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> Epsilon 2, Epsilon 3, Epsilon 4, you take what you like. Yeah. Alright, on this good discussion. <laughs> um,